Hey everyone, what's going on? Um, this is Brandon and Rob, and today's episode is, or podcast, if you want to call it that, is going to be mostly centered around faith um, and service in spirituality. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, you might call this uh, the Bodhisattva vow and how that plays out. Um, and we're just going to pull from some different examples throughout spirituality, maybe some Hinduism, some Christian ideas, some Buddhist ideas, um, and maybe other things. And, uh, just talk about the general idea about becoming closer to God or liberation or whatever your ultimate spiritual goal is uh, and how that relates to your ability to bring a better world and in, in <laughs> to be the, the case, to, to help other people. That's ultimately what we're talking about. This is uh, deeply related to the Pali word sila uh, in Buddhism, uh, which can loosely be translated to mean morality. And it's a huge part of awakening, in my opinion. And I think it's one of the most important parts. And I think it gets left out a lot uh, when it comes to certain communities, um, especially the actualized.org community. You know, there aren't many people there talking about their bodhisattva vows or, you know, their their desire to 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 use the the insights they're getting to then go bring those to the world. So this is kind of what we're talking about. This is what um, this is the purpose. So. Uh, we had a conversation for maybe an hour or so, hour and a half before this uh, on this topic. And honestly, I wish we were recording it. But uh, Rob, what kind of things were your favorite about that conversation? And what things do you think um, it would be most important for the viewers to know about all of this? What do you think we should start off with? My favorites were the interconnections that we were drawing. We drew a whole bunch of what for me were uh, pretty novel, but also slightly obvious, but also slightly not so obvious, interconnections between faith, between morality, between the dark night of the soul, St. John of the Cross's concepts of it, and also as it uh, translates to the progress of insight in Theravada Buddhism. Um, the Dukinanas, and um, I loved how we uh, how we interconnected so many of those and made so many novel um, and interesting connections just between those different concepts. And um, I like talking about Mother Teresa, and that could be a fun, like Brandon said at one point, would be a fun video topic. We could just be um, just be some conversations on some of uh, some books uh, about her, if not by her. Yeah, so the the core of this that that I see is ultimately you have to ask yourself what do you ultimately want liberation for? And to me the most honorable honorable and respectable people out there who are awakened or enlightened or liberated or God realize or whatever you want to, whatever word you want to yeah. put on a high level of <laughs> spiritual insight and understanding and mastery. These people have not only gone to, to reach this very freeing and um, in some ways pleasant, you might say state. Uh, it's not necessarily a consistent state, but um, once people get there, the people who I really look up to 
ultimately go on to, to bring this back into the world uh, in some way. And it doesn't need to always be teaching. But the, the idea is the goal isn't for you to just realize truth. Because if that's your goal, you, you'll probably find that at some point, you will want more because there is still a human side to you and you're not going to be in some permanent state where, (laughs) where you're in absolute love for forever to the highest degree Uh, is just like some locked in zone where you're outside of the realm of, of human interaction. So, what can you do after getting such such a realization or having such experiences? In, in my opinion, you, the goal is to bring this into your daily life. And the, the Buddhist word that I love so much and, and have been learning about recently is sila. And I think that sila or or morality ultimately gets revamped the higher you go into spirituality and the more insight you get you you ultimately realize that one of the highest possibilities or maybe the highest possibility for a human life is to take all of that love that you were able to find within your own subjective experience and find a way to bring it into this world. And for, for many people, you know, such as the Buddha, the idea was the best thing to do was to go teach it was to find out how to become a good teacher and actually bring people closer to this yourself. And I think this is one of the highest goals. And I, I personally have, have taken the Bodhisattva vow multiple times. And I think it's, I think it supercharged a lot of my spirituality and, and also balanced it and gave it a lot more purpose. And Recently, I had the deepest love and divine experience that I've ever had in my life. And I reached a dark night of the soul. And what ultimately brought me out of that was the realization that it's not necessarily about chasing that same state or higher states more and more and more, but what can I do with it? And I ultimately came to the conclusion that I want to live a more moral life. I want to live a better life in the world. And that has now become much more of my focus to the point where now I'm questioning if I want to use psychedelics uh, at this point, because I see them as very effective, but they also can be a distraction. It, it, it's like, if you're always getting these higher states, higher states, or, you know, blissed out states, or whatever you want to call it, or whatever arises for you when you do these psychedelics that you like these intense experiences there's ultimately a hollowness at the core because you're not doing anything for the world if you're just doing that if you're just pursuing that if that's your purpose is to just pursue more intense experiences or to get the truth for yourself, I think it's a very selfish way to look at spirituality. And you've got to realize that 
at the deepest levels, there's no separation between self and other. And when there's no when there's no separation, you realize that you should care for other beings just as much as you care for your own body and your own self. And you should be working to, in my opinion, and, and, and shoulds aren't necessarily an absolute thing. They're, they're a relative thing. We're talking about human life here, but I think human life obviously has a pretty big role in all of our spirituality. (laughs) um absolutely actually one I second i'm gonna open my window it's a bit it, hot in here sorry about that it can be something that really purifies the path and purifies your heart when you realize i'm no longer doing these awakenings or this work just for myself and for me now i've realized i've already gone down the psychedelic route pretty deep um and i've gotten some pretty good results on things like the the theravada buddhist path too um but getting all the spiritual progress and changing my experience and reducing my suffering and experiencing greater love for myself is not ultimately helping people if i just sit in my house all day so so the goal now is i want to live a holy life i by the time i'm dead i want to at least be known by some people at least some people who knew me well as a person who was dedicated to to bringing this to others so you know what are your thoughts on that how does that relate to where you're at right now rob i mean where what do you see um and and what do you how do you see that um i guess the last last little part of this question is where do you see the psychedelic or even meditative strong and intense experiences whether they be love or anything else fitting into this equation Um, I would say that I'm no expert on psychedelics, but I will say that experiences of love, of love for self, of love for other, um, of love for whatever is your highest conception of, uh, of good, of, of your, you know, your, your circle of care. Um, I'd say they're very, very crucial um because at, at least with regards to where i'm at it's very critical that i reach some level of happiness and love of my own life to be able to um bring bring about a beneficial change in the world to benefit others so in order for me to help others i have to put on my own oxygen mask first as they'd say on a plane um so i do think it's very critical there's the common saying you have to you have to fill up your own cup before you can help others you know before you can (laughs) help others fill up their cups you know just like the oxygen mask it's a it's a common thing if, if you're not an effective person in some regard, you can't go out and, and save the world. You can't go out and, mm. and do work that's gonna, going to, to be beneficial. So, but, but if we're only focused on that, as much as that might radiate out naturally um, and organically, We might be um, not only diminishing the good that we can bring about to others by focusing on it more directly, which is obvious, but even our own, the good that we can bring to ourselves. 
and the and the and the benefits that we can experience from making at least some effort to be moral while there is a need to make let's say quite a lot of effort to do that i think the goal with the happiness thing certainly is to reach a point where it takes a lot less effort to be moral and to be good and i think with regards to my own personal development and spiritual development a lot of it is about reaching a place where that it takes a lot less effort for me to be a really good person um and to be a lot of help to others but i don't want to completely ignore doing that while i focus on my own development so that's why i I'm think at. that's good it it is ultimately a a balancing act mm -hmm. um especially at the beginning you, stages i consider myself probably a novice in this work or you know if i want to get very cocky early intermediate we might say but um ultimately i so I'm, I, i see myself as very much at the beginning stages of the spiritual path and um and of working in personal development to develop myself and to help others um but um so yeah at the beginning yeah that's that's very very important but it's like like you were saying this is becoming more and more of, of your focus is less on developing yourself with these wonderful experiences that psychedelics can give you and more on um helping others and you're at what i would consider to be an advanced stage in your development so you've got pause yeah and the thing is the the more that might, i might look around time. it the more that i look around at actual spiritual masters um and and the people uh, the people that i really look up to in spirituality the more that i see it you know being close to truth or in enlightenment or liberation um it is only a very small part of being spiritually advanced so i personally would not call myself spiritually advanced because being spiritually advanced means being able to operate also within the world i i was reading a little bit uh on this book called seek seek gurus and it's about you know a number of seek gurus and it said that um you know they were able to you know skillfully live within the world but yet above the world and that's that's ultimately my goal and you know i want to develop myself and my skills within the world to be able to help people and um my personal guru in in hinduism uh or one of them in the heartfulness tradition the guru now is uh known as daji or kamlesh patel and uh it, at certain stages in his life uh i think even when he was quite spiritually advanced he was still doing a lot of business um and you know it was not spiritual business it was not a spiritual teaching but he was doing exactly what krishna is talking about in the bhagavad gita is ultimately the the best path to liberation which is working in devotional service now krishna says with krishna in mind but ultimately i see you know now daji might have krishna in mind when he's doing this or it might be a more abstract notion of the divine but either way he is always seems to be operating with this divine aspect within himself and even the way that he walks and the way that he you know talks and does all these things you can tell that something is different and um you know seeing someone like that and and 
reading his his understanding of of the chakras and the way they work toward liberation uh it's really quite eye-opening how much more there is than you know the typical non-dual seeker might think there is um there are a lot of systems that get left out one of my goals is i want to work in and really develop myself in in many different disciplines it's not just about reading books and and different disciplines but I, i want to ultimately go to the masters if i can if i can acts get access to them and i i want to to practice under them in multiple traditions in christian traditions in hindu traditions in the sikh tradition in the buddhist tradition in uh native american traditions um with homeless people, all kinds of things. There are so many people out there in the world who have genuine insight into God. Um, I bring up homeless people because I've had experiences recently um, while in some rather high spiritual states myself that I, I, it almost seemed like I was pulled by the law of attraction to be brought to these people. And I recognized that um, I recognized that to some degrees, you know, there are some of them that have very high levels of development in, in certain aspects of spirituality or understanding god that you're probably not going to hear anywhere else and it's the idea that even a a a lay person or someone who doesn't practice spirituality can teach you and one of the things that my meditation teacher says is uh he says something like you know, there's a point where, where everyone is a master that you're learning from. And, and that's, and I've, I've had states where I've, I've been able to access that and really truly have the completely selfless love and connection that I'm seeing the divine within them so much that I realize that they have answers too. And I'm not just some person who's been, who knows more about spirituality just because I've been doing it longer. That ultimately everybody's got a slice of the pie if you're conscious enough. If you're awake enough, everybody's got a slice of the pie. And that's where, you know, people like, you know, Mother Teresa or these really selfless and, and advanced gurus you know, that's, that's where I see some of these people falling. And I completely admit that, um, although I've had states and, and glimpses into this, I'm sure there are much deeper aspects of it and that it can be stabilized. And that's something I think is worth stabilizing. I don't think, you know, Frank Yang's description of his natural state where he says there's no solidity there's no solidity and he acts like that's so important most of the legit gurus are you know they might even experience that but they're gonna see him saying that as some you know marker of where you're at or something important and they're gonna say you know this is in a sense this is kind of child's play and this, this person's being arrogant. And this person is, is, is in a, is in a, is in a place of, is still in a place of ignorance at a, at a degree. Mm, in a lot and, of ways. In certain ways. And, um, you know, 
it's yeah in a lot of ways but at the same time frank frank spends a lot of his time uh coaching people on spirituality and he has pretty high levels of attainment for most people so i don't have any problems i love frank i've been you know following him for you know at, but way before i started spirituality and way before he started spirituality i i I first heard about Frank on a bodybuilding forum when I was 17. So, yeah, you know, I've the known same. the guy for a long time, you know, at least on the internet. But um, this is just the concept there that, that actual spiritual mastery is something so complete and uh, so difficult uh, that and so rare that it really takes a lifelong dedication to get there. Um, you know, there, there aren't 25 or, or I'm 26 now. There aren't 26 year old spiritual masters. There are 35 year old spiritual masters. If you're talking about Leo Gura or Frank Yang, there there this just simply isn't the case there hasn't been enough time for the maturity there hasn't been enough time for them to go and and truly develop this in in most cases from from my perspective you know tr true mastery truly developing oneself to be that complete in in one's knowledge and mastery it it needs to go much deeper, but at the same time for where, you know, these people I just mentioned are at, at their respective ages, they're on a very good trajectory to potentially get there one day, but they need to also, if you want to get there, you've got to have the focus to get there. If you're, if your goal is just to teach, um, personal development, you might never become a spiritual master, a, a true spiritual master and guru to the degree that I'm talking about. You might never get there. And, and you got to realize that even a lot of the examples that people might bring to mind when we say spiritual master are, are only masters in, you know, want one discipline or, or two disciplines or th three or eastern disciplines but they're not masters in the western disciplines and they still have biases against these other things um this all needs to be developed further um if you've still got a shadow of christianity um if you haven't spent a lot of time going really deep into the Bible, I, I, I don't think that you need that source of information for the very simple fact, even, even if you really want to claim that. Um, so anyway, where, where do you, what do you think of, of that kind of monologue that I went on for a while? I think you bring up a really good point. Um, spiritual development is not just about developing our own capacity to be in touch with God's love, to be in touch with spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's also about our capacity to embody that in how we interact with people. I would say how we interact with everyone at any point in our life, but also um career development how is that how does how, how does that affect your career you know and that's not just about being um being a guru or being a teacher as a career path that i think obviously you can you can do that but also you can of course integrate your spiritual understanding into your day job and one way that i've been doing that i'm a gardener and one way that i do that is i just try to show up really well and be really good at my job and that's that's my my way of doing karma yoga at the moment 
with regard to that aspect of my life is I try well, to Well, that's a great, a great that's gardener. a great that's and, a great way to do karma yoga. Yeah. You know, that's that's a great way. Not, you know, I I like to uh, I get a I get a great reward from impressing my boss and I get a great feeling that I'm um tidying be up people's gardens that. to a far be, to a far greater be, extent than if I was you, just skating by at the minimum amount of Pr- effort that Krish- I could get away with Krishna doing. Krishna said, Krishna said very clearly, uh, I think mul- I'm pretty sure quite a few times in the Bhagavad Gita that you should not work for the fruit of your work if you want, if you're to, to be progressing spiritually. Um you should do the work because it's your duty. (laughs) And uh, that's, so you do the work because it's your duty. Ultimately, the the highest goal is to to do it in devotional service for the divine. Um, But you're not doing the work so that you receive the fruits of your work. Mm, You do the work mm. because it's your duty. And so, and that, that releases attachment, uh, when you stop thinking I'm doing this to make this much money, or I'm doing this to make my boss happy. Instead, it's, I'm doing this because it's my duty and I should be doing this to the best of my ability. Yeah. And that's a hard thing. You know, if, that's a hard thing to, to in practice do. And that's why going about a, a really well-rounded approach to, to liberation is it's incredibly difficult. And that's, that's what we're know? shooting for with this, with this, with this discussion. This is really a talk about a well-rounded approach to liberation, something that expands from just the personal aspect to the collective aspect. And then also, like you said, to this divine aspect where you're not just helping the collective for the rewards that you get from that or that they get from that even it but simply for the for the the the, the inherent goodness in the act itself yeah just a moment uh the reason no, my dad, did you want to go get food or anything or you're busy I'm ready to take a break. I've been up early. Work all day. All right. Well, yeah. thanks for bringing that by. Yeah. Did you check your count? I haven't yet. What's that? Over a thousand? Up 115. So oh, far, wow. So far today. Wow, that's good. Like 20%. Wow. I'm, I'm glad I kept it. I sold Neo. So <laughs> Neo was down hard. That was a yeah, bad, you that was a bad buy. How much did you lose? I don't know, maybe in total, maybe like 400 on it. Well, you can't expect it to go up right away. I mean, we bought it at the worst time. It was the highest ever. Yeah, we, we I mean, did. Yeah, but look at that. I mean, it's just going to go, go, go. People was figuring it out. Well, I might need to sell it here soon to get a car, so <laughs> I probably will. Get your I'll have to. First. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you. Thank There's you. There's other things you can do and not worry about a car. What do you mean? Um, Pat's brother, for instance, he drives a taxi, but it could be that he could pick you up. It'd be cheaper than two or three. <laughs> things like that. The word Larry. I mean, he's just an old fart. <laughs> a taxi to and from? I mean. Well, I'm just saying, you can see what he charged. Just personally, not the taxi, just him. Oh, personally? Just well, him. well, why don't you give me, text me his number. I'll, I'll give him a call. I don't know if I got his number. Okay. Well, look into it. Thank you. Parental issues in the Joro studio. Yeah, my, my dad was, uh, my dad was bringing me some toilet paper. <laughs> um but anyway so yeah i don't have a car right now the the reason for that is basically because uh 
I wasn't uh, considering other people with my um, awakenings. I had a God consciousness awakening while I was uh, driving and um, I went above like a hundred miles an hour and then uh, it basically like my perception shifted and it felt like I was in a video game mm. and that none of the people were real. Mm. And while I was hitting that gas, that was the reality I was in. And it's funny, as soon as I saw the, like a semi truck in front of me and cars around me, and I could have maneuvered to get around, but then I had consideration for the others and I hit the brakes, a cop was there. And it's almost wow. like, it's almost like there wasn't a cop in my rear view mirror, you know, at least perceptually for me, this is what it was like. There wasn't a cop in my rear view mirror. Um, and then all of a sudden, when I, when I go out of that solipsistic God consciousness experience, I immediately uh, get the repercussions of, you know, breaking the laws within this reality. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, is any of that stuff that I perceive actually true? You know, realistically, I'd say that I was probably deluded. But, you know, that's, that's the big part of these awakenings is you get into level, it, it accesses, it increases faith. Go look into the five strengths of Buddhism if, if you're questioning what I'm talking about right now uh, for anyone watching. Um, these are the things that, that relate to awakening. So if, if you're in an awakening, you're probably going to be at a much higher level of faith and it might be uh, really unbalancing your wisdom. So if you think you're in some solipsistic reality, um, you might be wrong. You might be right. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying it also might be that your faith has just gone up a lot exponentially be because you're in this awakening and then you get in a feedback loop of thought or even, you know, perception just, and you think that, you know, that how things work in all of reality. And maybe you don't motherfucker. Maybe you're just on some, you know, maybe you're just in some, you know, personal awakening and you're not all of fucking reality in one sensory bubble. We can consider that possibility. You know, if you don't consider that possibility, at least a little bit, as far as you're down the road of awakening as you are, I don't care. If you don't, if you aren't open to consider it, I think you're being a little foolish. Keep your mind open that you could be wrong no matter how deep it feels just because something feels deep or true doesn't mean necessarily that it is. Mm. Mm. I think that's and, a parallel. Though. And, and I want to say for all the, the, you know, for if there is anyone watching out there who who's disagreeing with that, I want to, I want, I want to say to you, okay, then apply that to all of the Christians out there who's, faith you disagree with and always you know probably judge because they're making assumptions based on high levels of faith without all of the data you see where i'm going mm, mm, mm. i was going to draw faith a parallel without, there. Yeah. It, it's a clear it, it this is in the sati patana sutta in buddhism which is the the main sutta they use for Vipassana training and meditation, that if you have too much faith, it will unbalance your wisdom. With too much wisdom also creates problems if there's not enough faith. The balancing factor between those two, that the factor that works best to balance the two is mindfulness. 
So, but yeah, you've, you've got to consider that um, too much faith is not necessarily a good thing. Um, but too little faith is definitely not a good thing either. You want to be progressing toward awakening in a balanced way. And, and that's why I'm considering your own safety uh, and the safety of others. Yeah. That's why I'm considering taking a, a hiatus from all psychedelics, even THC now for my own life and mental health. And also so I can hopefully get closer to my personal ideal of becoming a person who can live a moral life spiritually and become a well-rounded spiritual person instead of just some person who's interested in my own liberation. Because I've realized I've had cessation. I've had at the very least Theravada Buddhism stream entry. And I've had a lot of other stuff that makes me pretty advanced in certain senses mm, yeah. and certain little aspects of spirituality. I'm pretty fucking line, yeah. crazily advanced. Very developed, you know, yeah. I'm a pretty, for, for being 26, I'm pretty doing pretty well. But as far as the whole picture goes, yes. as far as the whole picture goes, yes. there yeah. is so much more that I have to do. Absolutely. 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 There's always, there's always more, there's always more, there's always more work to be done. Hopefully yeah. it doesn't always feel like work, but. Um, I mean, this doesn't feel duty. like work. Yeah. This yeah. doesn't feel like work, but this, this, I feel like aligns with my duty. And, and I, I say if, and this was in a video, um, I don't know if it was said by Osho, it wasn't his voice. But um, the video was titled, and you can look it up on YouTube, anyone watching, it's called Osho uh, Satori Sudden Awakening. And um, yeah, in, in that video, it, it, it just ties into uh, similar things I've been uh, talking about here. I forget what, what was this? Where was I at specifically before I brought up that video? Cause I, I um, lost you were talking about how you were developed along the lines of personal, spiritual understanding, personal realization, but that there were many other lines to be developed that you had yet to develop on and that you even were experiencing a sort of unbalance of where you were very advanced one particular aspect of spirituality. But for example, morality, which was where the sort of the, the, the main topic of this video was um was where you saw the most of your progress um at least in the in the in the near future lying in developing yeah so i guess i i still don't connect where where i was going and the reason why i brought up that video but one thing i can say about that video is their definition of satori was far different than what i thought satori was when i said i had it for one and then also samadhi is way different in their definition they say that it's a constant orgasm of basically all of your experience forever is yeah. what they say samadhi is in in that video so you know do i have that you know how how loving and kind would I be able to be to everyone if that was my inner experience? You know, good question. Another problem is if that was my experience, would I have motivation to go helping people? Well, ultimately the teacher who's speaking in the video is trying to get people. Oh, I remember my train of thought. I was saying if one person gets benefit that brings them toward liter liberation or well-rounded spirituality that ultimately leads them to help other people, which I believe this video will have like 900 subscribers, like 50 or 30 or 60 people are going to watch it. And, you know, most people are going to watch it because I know the watch time. They're going to watch it for like five or six minutes. Okay. And they're going to get just tiny little, just a tiny little bit yeah. out yeah. of it. 
and and the if they get a tiny discussion. little bit of the idea that they need to be more spiritually well-rounded and they need to be more focused on service to others then this was all worth it and this and we were saying duty i feel that this is my duty but there's also no resistance here you know when i go to do my normal job there's probably you know there will probably feel to be more resistance now i could get into a video about you know how there's actually no resistance ever but um that's for another another video um <laughs> um but yeah i mean i feel like finding one's duty and and going with that uh that's that's one of the wisest things in my opinion that that krishna said and you you do your duty and he's telling when he says do your duty he's telling arjun or arjuna whatever, however you want to say it to that he should go kill his relatives and you know cousins and family members in a war and not lament because he has to go do it because it's his duty to get his kingdom back because he is the rightful ruler and he is a more compassionate person he's the one who should be ruling this area of india hmm. so krishna was saying the soul is never born and never dies don't worry about killing people if that is your true duty but also this is not a video where i'm saying it's fine to go kill people it's krishna said to a warrior king in a battle mm. that it mm. was okay Mm. because that was clearly his duty at the time mm. in that very specific circumstance your duty Given you know was. part of your duty a small part of your duty is to be a gardener is to be a gardener at a spiritual center mm. so so do that okay but when that ultimately comes to feel like it is not your duty and you should do something else with your life and something else calls you a higher thing calls you go pursue that and do your duty and don't lament when you're doing your duty is to the best of your ability yeah, yeah. and ultimately you'll find a higher the duty. plant's got to die for me to do my duty i've got to cut the branches and i've got to weed yeah, the garden well, so the flowers exactly, can blossom exactly you you don't have to 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 lament for the the dead flowers or you know yeah. whatever it's it's part of life that's what you're meant to do in the moment uh or at least it seems mm. and it's important mm. to examine your duty but and and always be conscious that that might change so you know my duty right now is to try to give the very best spiritual teaching that i can and you know be as present to the moment as I can, so I could provide that. Um, yes, yeah. So where do you where do you want to go with the rest of this? I mean, how do you want to tie it in with mm. where we've been, mm. and you know, maybe what uh, we talked about before we well, started? Well, I'm glad the you said tie it in because there was something I was going to tie in, which was when you were talking about balancing the five strengths in Buddhism. We we're talking about balancing wisdom and faith specifically. And I wanted to tie that in with um, the jhanas and with uh, Vipassana, so Sumatha and Vipassana. And Daniel Ingram spoke in MCTV2. He said that, I can't remember which sutra it was he referenced, but at some point the Buddha or somewhere in the canon, it, it was discussed that the, the path, the meditative path was about developing the jhanas and then developing discernment from within the jhanas and developing, um, being able to notice how each jhana, specifically, this is a me paraphrasing now, but how how is this jhana dissatisfactory? And that ties in with what you were talking about with your on your kai. If you think you're in this wonderful bliss, love experience, 
that's sort of what I'm tying in with, with being in some wonderfully peaceful jhana. Maybe, you know, you feel like nothing could make this any better. This is perfection. This is the, the deepest of the deep. But as uncomfortable and disturbing as it is, maybe what's best for your development is then from within that jhana to, de- to develop a little bit of vipassana and start noticing the three characteristics in it. And maybe you lose access to the jhana. Maybe you pop back out. And maybe you ha- maybe it's going to take you a while to align those two to where you're able to do that from within that jhana. And then the next yeah. jhana, the next jhana, the next jhana. And um, that's the parallel I was going to draw there. And I think we could probably pursue that route because I think there's so many more parallels to be drawn there. And there was, um, before we started recording, we, we, we were talking, uh, Brandon was telling me a story well, about Gobi. In a sense, you could, in a my, sense, you could consider, from, you could consider liberation. Thanks. You could consider liberation for yourself or once you get it, pursuing some higher state or some higher knowledge or understanding or whatever. Or, or fine tuning it for yourself. Um, that is like a jhana. It's the con. It's the nice concentration state. It's what yeah. you want to do. Yeah, it feels but, so good. But what you should do to move forward is actually take what you've already found and bring it to the billions of people on planet Earth. <laughs> and affect their lives in the best way you can even if it's not and, as comfortable and that's gonna and that's gonna, and that's gonna and that's gonna affect how the, those billions of the people trip. you know eat animal products and cause suffering to animals and that's and then that's gonna cause you know, what's happening to the plants and then, you know, what's happening to the planet and what's happening in global warming. It's all interrelated. Um, so that's the idea is liberation and, and, and being stuck on becoming the highest thing, which I certainly was, can't you say? is ultimately something you need to get yourself out of so you can go help. Mm. And that's Mm. like the, that's like the Vipassana of life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And we don't like the insight. That's like the developing the insight that, that, that if we want to say that um, just as a parallel, I mean, it's not directly related um, to call it like insight, but um you go there to the opposite and that's what yoga is yoga is is yoking yoke comes from the the olden days when they would put two oxen together with a little wood with a well not little but with a wooden object like they would put two oxen together that's what that's one of the the interpretations that I've heard several or more than several times about what yoga means. Yoga is ultimately about yoking. Karma yoga, for example, is about, okay, how can I operate in a more divine way within this normal karmic existence? Okay, how can I bring my understanding of the divine and maybe even experience of the divine. If you're a spiritual person, how can I bring that and, and relate it and, and make it a unification, make it a (laughs) non-duality, you know, between the two, how can the, your living life, how, how can you going to, out, out to eat at a restaurant, be a divine experience, whether you're in some, a divine expression, what, whether you're in some high state or not, how, how well do you, do you greet the, the people there? How, how, how compassionate are you for the people? Do you consider, oh, if they don't have a table ready, do you say, 
you know, well, we'll fuck them, fuck this restaurant, you know, they're not good at their business, I'm going somewhere else, you know, or do you say, or do you say, you know, oh, is there a way to, it, you think, is there a way to help? And yeah, maybe yeah. there isn't. Or do you, but you, you look at things in this, in this other perspective, yeah, you live yeah. life, you live life by divine principles. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot more, it's a much more considerate way to handle that situation. It's a much more self-transcendent way to conduct yourself because in line for the rest you're of not, it. you're not fighting for just your concerns at that point. You're considering, Oh, what, what kind of stress are these workers under? Am I going to be in a mean voice tone when I talk to them? Or am I going to say, hey, man, it looks like you guys are busy. You know, should should we just come in another day? And they're like, oh, no, we can get a table for you because you you address them nicely. They say, oh, we've got this table in the back and we'll pull it out for you. You know, who knows what happens? But when you operate in this type of way, it opens up a world of possibilities and Absolutely. and and it, it does, it's not about the possibilities or the fruits that you get from from living a a unified life it's about the process itself it's about being that mm, mm. i really like the merely yeah. through the compassion itself yeah compassion for compassion's sake itself yeah you know being divinity and a human for the sake of the, the unification itself, rather than any fruits that come from it. Brandon, tell, tell the audience the story that you were telling me before about the Gobi who went to, who was sent to hell. And then I'll, I'll, and then I'll tie that in with what you were just saying. Do you remember that? Okay. So, so the, the Gobi wasn't uh, sent to hell. Oh, okay. It was, it was that people were fearing that they would be. But anyway, so um, this is an old Hindu story. Um, and this is about Krishna. So there was a time uh, when Krishna, I believe he was younger and he fell ill and everybody was giving him different treatments and stuff and nothing was working. And Krishna just kept telling them, you know, this won't work you know you have to rub the dust of your feet on my forehead and all of the spiritual people and all of the gopis or spiritual girls or women um around said were afraid to do so because they thought that you know for one in indian culture the feet are kind of seen as dirty things I've been to, you know, Indian people's houses um, who were spiritual people like and I meditated with them and they actually keep their shoes outside of the house, not just like in the you know, front of the house and you take them off when you get in. They take them off before you even go in the house. So the the gopis and everybody else were, were like, we're not going to do that. We don't want to go to hell. That was their primary concern. They didn't want to put something so disgusting from their perspective on the head of God. And <laughs> um, even though God was asking for it and um, they went around and, and Krishna said, you know, go ask for this one gopi. He asked for a specific one. And um, they they went, and I think it was in like a, a slightly different location. They went there, and they asked her, and she immediately went there, and um, she she did it pretty much right away. And then all the other gopis and everybody's like, you know, why did, you know, how did you know to do that or you know why why were you so confident to do that basically and she said because you know my faith and 
you know, connection to Lord Krishna and, and knowledge that he is all loving is, is so complete that I know that even if I go to hell, that he will still be there and I can still connect to him and I will be fine. And that was um, it. And he was fine immediately as she did that. Um, so that's the story. That's the story. And she did her duty. And she did her duty because she wasn't attached to the fruits. In this case, not the fruits, the opposite of fruits, the uh, consequences of well, of not doing her duty, but um, but um, it's a, it's the same sort of thing. It's it's a, it's a, it's an attachment, right? But so the, the parallel that I was going to draw there was that even if she went to hell, hell we can conceive of as being, or at least I conceived of it when Brandon told me this is this complete disconnect from God. It's the worst of the worst. It's the ultimate dark night. It's the ultimate severance of that connection you had once known, that love that you had felt, that direct experience of God. If we're going to talk about the progressive insight map, this is your A and P. You're directly, you don't need to have faith in God when you have a direct experience of God, when you're feeling that love. What about when you're not feeling that love? There's yeah. no direct experience of God. What and do you need? It's you funny, need that not, faith. You not, need that duty, that to... doing it for no reason other than itself. And that's what faith is. That's what, <laughs> that's the, that's the whole, that's the, the kernel of what, of, of, of faith. It's, there's, it's, it's against all odds, no matter what those odds are. Maybe those odds are a hell. Maybe those odds are a complete severance from a direct experience of the divine, but you still hold it, that faith. And it's, it, it's funny that the, the way that I attain cessation I was driving and I felt an explosion in my heart chakra while I was thinking about how much I appreciated and love the Luciferian psychic who is my twin flame. And as this love explosion happened in my heart chakra, it immediately went up to my crown chakra and went up. And then it was infinite Holy Spirit, infinite Holy Spirit through the crown chakra. And in that very moment, I had the intuitive thought. It wasn't even an effortful thought. It happened automatically. I said, essentially, Lucifer, I give you or I give myself to you as an eternal Stu student you will be my eternal guru if you give me enlightenment <laughs> and um it was and immediately i went into the eighth jhana and then cessation and then since then ever since then i've become so closer and closer and closer to jesus christ and it's the idea that in seeking God for so many years, I eventually came to a place where I wasn't afraid of going to, according to everybody else's idea, God's greatest enemy to ultimately come closer to God through that. Because my ultimate goal was enlightenment and God, and I wanted to be close to that. And you have to realize that you shouldn't have fear of anything if you are truly seeking God, if you're truly seeking liberation. This is not, it does not make sense. And, and only the, only the people who don't truly understand will fear these types of actions. The people who are truly dedicated to God will be willing to do any risk. They will risk going to hell for eternity. They will risk rub. And, yeah, I mean, that's what you did. You rubbed and, your, your, your feet, all the dust on your feet, on the face of God by communing with Lucifer. But it was yeah. for your highest good. Yeah.
And um, truth, truth. Oh man, what a <clears throat> what a wonderful concept that is. Well, one of the th ways that I like to conceive of truth is if something's true, it has to always be true under any condition or circumstance. Otherwise, it's not true. It's part of the condition or circumstance. And what? And sometimes, for me, most of the time, I don't feel like I have much of a direct experience of God. But one thing that I can do is know that the truth is already true, and which is an act of faith. And so in doing that, even though I'm not having the feeling of being connected to God, by having the knowledge that I am, I'm recreating that connection in a way that is independent of circumstance, at least you yeah. know, to, to the extent that I can remember to do that, right? But um, that's another beautiful thing about faith is Faith is a path to the divine that large, it works under any circumstance. I'm as well, no, that's obviously you don't always have faith, but the idea with faith, at least as I conceptualize it, is that you it's this thing that you can always do. And that's sort of largely the point. Yeah. And so that kind of makes it a really, a really, direct and a really unique and profound path to truth. But faith is also going to amplify. Faith is also going to amplify, um, you know, any awakenings you're having. This is why, you know, people like me who have bipolar disorder, one big part of it is that we have ridiculous levels of faith while we're in this and it makes us misperceive things and all kinds of stuff and do delusions and all of that, you know, yeah. riskier, yeah. wacky things, but it all ultimately creates incredibly strong awakenings without most of the time, without any drugs, just completely natural. It it's a lot of it is the faith. It's, self is is creating some of these chemical interactions now in a lot of cases the chemical interactions might start the process for some people but it's the it's higher levels of faith that amplify a lot of what's going on because like some of the bhakti and faith work that we've done, you know, we've both directly experienced, um, for me, a number of times, um, completely like faith law of attraction without any doubt. I just have the faith and I create an awakening without drugs or, you know, anything it's, it's pretty talk miraculous. about direct path right it is miraculous yeah and that's something you said you said that you saw somewhere that that krishna said that faith is is the yes. quickest path yes it was in a video called Deliberate. what is bhakti and it was like an it was from a spiritual infographics they're not entirely they do podcasts and discussions as well but they had like a series of infographics um, like sort of mini episodes, sort of like Kyrgyzstan is, but for these spiritual concepts and they talk about what is karma, what is um, um, Maya. And one of them was what is Bhakti. And one of the things they mentioned in that was that Lord Krishna said that the fastest path to him was through devotion, was through Bhakti, was through, um, I don't know if they mentioned faith specifically, but that's part of the definition of Bhakti. Well, devotion, well, I see it as basically, devotion is basically made of two parts, which is, it, which is love and faith. You can't have devotion without love and you can't have true devotion, deep devotion without love and you can't have it without faith. You've got to have faith that Krishna is real and you've also got to have uh, 
at least some sort of appreciation, I would say love is really what you want there. Not just some sort of like detached appreciation for some aspect of him, but no, an actual love for him. So it's, it's that. And, you know, I've done a lot of, uh, let a lot of listening to the, the Bhagavad Gita and, um, you know, I, I reached my cessations through, through, you know, the, the chakras of rather, you know, in a lot, in a lot of ways, a, a Hindu model, but also a Christian model, the, the, sh- the chakras are, or rather, I would say the, the Holy spirit, um, both are essentially um, variations of the same thing. And, um, but it's not without, you know, a lot of faith and devotion for, for these different things. You know, ultimately it was, you know, there was devotion for Lucifer. It wasn't just that I wanted to get enlightenment, but it's that I also ultimately saw many values and, and loved him as well. I, I, I had two spontaneous intuitive promptings to pray to Lucifer in a couple manic episodes. And these were times of immense faith. I saw porch light, a porch light, like flickering as if it was having electrical issues. Um, Two, on two separate occasions, like a year apart, two different manic episodes. And both times I was intuitively prompted in a way kind of by the Holy Spirit to pray to Lucifer. And I, I o- overcame the, the, the momentary fear and I did it. And ultimately that led me to a path where I... I went to a psychic for the first time and within uh, the first or second session, she randomly asked me, what's your relationship with Lucifer? And when I told her that I had prayed a couple times, she told her that told me that she is Luciferian. And then we discussed it. And then ultimately I realized that, so many of the qualities that were really core to myself were within her. And, um, yeah, that love for her, that in a sense, that devotion to her, (laughs) um, was your object of acting. Yeah. Yeah. That, that devotion of her, um, led to a crown chakra awakening, which, um, You know, most people say uh, the crown chakra is, you know, the most important or in a sense, the strongest. So that paired with all of the development I had been doing for months on my crown chakra work. Allowed me to go to a maximization of the Holy Spirit that essentially ended up breaking reality. (laughs) Uh, as far as my subjective experience goes. Got to love those reality-breaking experiences. Yeah. Nothing like breaking a bit of reality. Yeah, I'll just talk about really briefly here to end. Um, I don't know if you want to end. It kind of feels like we've we've reached this like kind of nice moral of the story. It just feels very ending-y. Maybe not. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're on a completely different vibe. Um, Anyway, the thing I was going to say was an experience that I'd had using Jed McKenna's spiritual autolysis technique, which he teaches in his book, Spiritual Enlightenment, The Damnedest Thing. And this was shortly after I'd, um, after I'd read that or listened to it rather. Um, and I was practicing spiritual autolysis. And what spiritual autolysis is, is it's a form of contemplation with a journal, just like in actualize.org. You can see his video. It's basically the same thing. You try to arrive at truth through writing down through sort of working from first principles. So you try to write down what you think is true. And then is that really true? I'm not sure. Let's keep, let's keep journaling. And so you're doing the sort of stream of consciousness journaling exercise 
where you're trying to arrive at something that you know absolutely to be true. And what I arrived at was that the conclusion that, wait a minute, I don't know if anything's true. Things just seem true if I believe they're true. And then I tried a little experiment, which is, well, what if I believe that truth is absolute goodness? And I said, what if I just, just set aside for a second all my fears and all my doubts and all my skepticism, and I just try to see if this is really true by believing it. And I, I'd, I'd work, I built up to this point by doing all of this spiritual autolysis over the, over the, 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 the days and weeks leading up to this. And, and, and just getting so frustrated with it. And so I just, I, I, I had enough of this energy. I had enough of this motivation to do it. And I tried it and I had this profound experience, no psychedelics of just absolute good and absolute faith. And it was just by, by just fucking placeboing myself there. And it, and that was really, I think my first reality breaking experience. And um, one of my most profound awakenings because I realized, holy shit, if I just believe something unconditionally, it actually is fucking true. And now I'm, I'm not going to say that I still believe any of that, but um, as an exercise and the experience that that actually generated, wow, what a mindfuck. And I think another thing I did was not just believe it was good. I believe that it was all unified yeah, and all one. I wanted to see if I could get enlightened at, from it, really. At the end of the, the day, I would say... At and the I, end I, of the I, day, I got I a real experience of what I would it consider was, enlightenment. It was, it was, enlightenment, it was but, uh, probably, it was probably lacking, it was probably lacking the, the balance of, of wisdom. There you go, there you go, there you go. Because I, I'd, I'd left that behind. I'd, I'd done all this, this really skeptical process leading up to it and it led me to this 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 kind of just this really black and white conclusion where i just left behind the wisdom altogether and i went all in on the faith and my mind became well, one-pointed we could say and and it and it worked to generate what i would consider a reality breaking experience or an enlightening experience i, I probably called calling it enlightenment was certainly uh, a very much an over overestimation of what it was but um it was certainly enlightening and it was reality breaking and it was a mind fuck because if i could believe anything to be true and and that made it true with unconditional belief then i mean maybe maybe leo's right maybe i am fucking god and and there's only something rather than nothing because i'm believing this that i'm believing it into into being It was a mindfuck, man. It was a later one that, that, that came later, which was during meditation, where I was, I was meditating very deeply on the breath. And I was, really, I was in a really equanimous state. I was in a samadhi. And, and, I, was, and I was noticing the, um, what's it called? The, um, the arising and passing of sensations, how sensations are just like um, uh, on and offs. It's like, it's there, it's not there, it's there, it's not there, it's there, it's not there. And, um, and, I, and I sort of came to a sort of a similar ability where I was able to actually the physical sensation of the breath. So not just my belief about the breath, but the physical sensation itself. I was able to make that stop and enter a formless jhana by just becoming so concentrated and having such, such, an, such a, sort of a focused, uh, um, unconditioned mind that I was able to, to go completely into we could say the gaps between the on off on off on off of the sensations that are making up this breath the, of the vibrations the vibrations that's what daniel ingram talks about and that's sort of what what, what i was uh, using as my as a as a as a pointer for directing that practice and that was a mind fuck because that's a fucking physical sensation that's not just my beliefs about reality that's a physical fucking sensation yeah that's you know uh, a lot of the the pasna stuff and also jhanas it's it, it gets really deep yeah
well do you want to keep going or uh, yeah you if think? you want to keep I, talking if you got something to say i don't know i mean and i'll try and we might we might just jump end, that. end it yeah here it's a good just, place to end it is yeah we might just end it here and i think we went on a really a cool bit. uh Really Maybe cool talk sort of journey a with bit this one. More personally, if oh, absolutely. you want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Keep down for that. But um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of ground. I don't know how how long is this motherfucker? <laughs> Do you see? Oh, no, it's gone for at least an hour. It's been at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, it's, it's been good length, pretty long. Good length for a podcast. Yeah, so, all right, well, um, let's end it here and we can keep talking uh, on WhatsApp. Thank you for watching, everybody. Yeah, we'll catch you next day. time, guys. Like and subscribe. Comment below. Yeah, for sure. Comment below. <gasps> oh, smash it. Smash the like button. You got to. Ah, oh, shit. All right, bye.